Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this edition of Follow Suit, Fashion Unfiltered. Follow Suit is a mantra, which means to follow the suit. And as you follow it, you're going to come to realize the suit is a role model and a mentor whose purpose is to give guidance to the young men of this community and as well as to society. And it is my goal to honor and salute some of the individuals who not only put on the suit, but they wear it well. Hence the point, my guest today. All right, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Follow Suit. Just like the intro says, this is Follow Suit Fashion Unfiltered. And today we have a special guest. This is going to be a special podcast, you know, because I have the honor and the privilege to have a guest here who's done work in the community and I've been admiring his work from afar and now I have the privilege of having him here right in front of me. So today my guest is Rob Gibbs, aka Pro Black. How you doing, brother? Peace, bro. How you feeling? I'm doing all right. I appreciate you, you know, taking time out of your schedule to come through mm-hmm. and sit down with me. You know, sure. like I said, it's been something that must have been put together in the stars in the making for us to be here today. Indeed. You know, like I said, I seen your work all through the city. And, you know, just admiring it. And then one day someone put me and said, this is the guy right here. And I said, well, hey, let's make this thing happen. So I appreciate you coming through. Oh, it's an honor to be here, man. So, Thank you for having me. So for the show is called Follow Suit Fashion Unfiltered. And, of course, the follow suit is a, man, a mantra about, you know, trying to inspire young men to dress for success is basically what my whole program and everything is about. And it's also about saluting people who do work in the community. And you're one of those brothers who's doing work in the community, so I want to honor you and salute you today. So we're going to start off with a little bit of fashion. Of course, you're an artist and a painter, Mm -hmm. you know, and so... I hope you like what I did today. Oh, this yeah. is my, this is what I consider painting. I painted this today for you, brother. I peep game, I okay. peep game, all right. So this was the, I put this together. I said, man, I gotta do something. I said, I'm, what, what looks like a painting that I got? So well, I put this together just mm-hmm. for you. Well, the tie in the pocket piece, I see you color blocked off of that real well. Yes, Thank you. Down to the socks, <laughs> you know I what I mean? Say, you know. And so, um, growing up, Seeing that you was an artist, was fashion also a thing with you? Fashion was a big thing, man. You know, my grandfather always told me, dress how you want to be addressed. Nice. You know, and um, there was there was some rebellion against that because it was always the standard, you know, get you a shirt, some slacks, and, and, and some good shoes so that your feet don't spread out in all those sneakers you wear. But, you know, we were hip-hop, so it was just about taking things that were looked over every day and just mashing it up well so that like whether I was going to school or if I was like at an assembly or anything of that nature I fit in but I was myself so I felt like you know fashion played a big part in just us vocalizing who we were Plus, we wore, like, big clothes, yo, so. <laughs> now, you was in the era of the big clothes. <laughs> I was in the era of the big clothes, brother, so, you know, I was like, some big dude is going to be mad <laughs> that I got these 44 jeans, and the, the cool thing about getting that stuff is that we were altering them to make sure that it fit and fell on us well, right. you know, so it'd be these little dudes in these big clothes, you know? All right, well, I mean, you know, still, you got fast, you got on... Your blazer, everything, you got your tie on, you got the knot tied tight. Hey. Big question, who taught you how to tie a tie? My old man, my pops, he taught me how to tie a tie. Now, the thing is, is I wasn't doing it every day to remember, but I remember the trick, you know what I mean? It was always about keeping the hand you hit somebody with tight. (laughs) (laughs) And so when you get it tight, everything else becomes effortless. It's the flip, the fold, everything over the shoulder. Um... It just became natural because there's things that he would say to me that I'll never forget, yeah. you know. So my old man taught me how to tie a tie. It was just wild, though, because the only way he can do it is if it's on me. So I'm non-traditional. I do it backwards right. because of how he taught me. Yeah, you know? I had a guess on it. He ties it on his knee. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> he can't put it on his neck. He has to tie it. He tell. ties it on his knee, and then he puts it on, you know. So Around his arm, and then he throws everybody, it. Everybody has their, you know, their own thing. So. Mm-hmm. Within fashion, is there any designers that you ever took a liking to? Oh, man, um, we took hard to, like, polo. You know what I mean? It was, um, that the, the era of the low heads was, was very real in our, in, our, in our world. And being this far up north, 
there wasn't that much access to Ralph Lauren as we know. So there's one of those things where if we were going inside of department stores or you seen like a crew on a hip hop video rocking the illest pieces, you know, you had to match your low up with your Timbos. And then um, sneakers were like whatever came out that you can afford at the time because when Jordans were popping and they were over a hundred dollars, there was no way in the world you could convince your moms and pops to get a over a hundred dollar pair of sneakers. So it was about finding what made sense with you, had you look hip hop, and that you can just you know match up with the illest pair of kicks because you wasn't really getting them unless it was, you was going back to school, your birthday, Easter, and Christmas. Four times a year, you would possibly get some sneakers. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah. So you know, I, we was talking a little bit off camera. You was you was in the sports, but you just didn't play them in school. Right. But you you know you have that background, so you know all the guys in sports. You know the coaches and everybody, mm -hmm. and everything like that. You know. And so um, let's just talk about when did you realize that you you had a gift of with your art, with your with your drawing and painting skills. When I realized I had the gift is when. Um, I always wanted to see if I can do things. My grandfather was real firm on us to make sure that we were sharp with our arithmetic and, and just being like smart. Right. And so he would give us these workbooks that when we finish our homework, we get to the workbook, we fill up a workbook. He's giving us the, the comic strips, the funnies to like do the cryptic quotes and the what's it's and the word searches. And I finished those fast just so I can get outside. I started copying the comic strips in the meantime because I'm either waiting for my cousin or my cousin's waiting for me right. so that we can go out. And it was like a little secret weapon, like, yo, if I seen something, I can draw it and just, you know, make sure it happens. I used to watch my dad on the phone, and he'd doodle. And he used to have this side profile of, like, a dude with an afro and, like, a little, you know, pointy nose. And I was like, yo, he's kind of nice with it. And his penmanship was always tight. So when I have a friend of mine, we met around eight years old. Dudes get on punishment, naturally come out and talk like you've been inside for a long time. And a friend of mine by the name of Damon Butler, man, he used to come out with these drawings of all the cartoons that we love. And I'm like, yo, how can you sit down? and draw all these while the cartoons is on. He's like, nah, I did it from my head. And I'm like, what? So I'm looking at all this stuff, and then all it took was for me to say, yo, you know what? I can do that. <laughs> but I took a different route in doing it because I wanted to hit it from the aspect of doing graffiti. And so when I realized I had the talent, it was just from being around other graffiti writers from different parts of the city, where I was like, yo, I have a style, and it holds weight right. with, you know, my other brothers and a couple of sisters, I was getting down paying. Right. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so, you know, like I said, we saluting brothers in the community, doing stuff in the community. So you have a program. I was surprised when you told me about the program that you're part of where you're bringing young artists up, you know, and how long this program has been going on. So let's talk about that a little bit, the name of it and everything. Yeah, yeah. The program that I started 30 years ago, it's called Artists for Humanity. And um, it's a it's a it's an artistic experience where we hire kids around the city to go through our studios to get like pretty much a job training. If I told you you coming in during the orientation that you were receiving job training, you know, a young person might roll their eyes and be like, oh, God, yeah, we about to do something. But we're like, nah, this is going to be an experience where you can be in an art studio under mentorship with mentors who are masters in their craft by, their, by right. And we have a year-round program where during the school year we operate three days a week. Summertime is five days. And we help them understand who they are through the artistic, you know, experience, through the creative process. Right. right. So we've been just rocking in a studio that was as small as a two-car garage and started evolving from, like, 10,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet, moving to two different locations where, like, you know, we were always a spectacle because it was a program full of young people. And then we finally decided to get our own building. Right. And from that building, we've been able to cater to just about 
six, seven, ten generations of just art, artists that are in the creative industry right now. Right. You know, creating a direct pipeline to the creative industry from Boston or any art college that they wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. So did you, um, in all the years of doing the things you're doing, do you think this came across uh, uh, one kid or a couple of kids that without that art might have saved their life by giving them that that opportunity of showing them something different than what we see in our community and as we grow up? I've been told, man, I've been told, and there's been a couple of people that went on record documenting that, like, from the first time I put a brush in their hand, that they've seen a whole different part of themselves. And all I did, and I felt like I just gave them more time to figure out who they were, you know, get you off the street and in front of a canvas or put you through a project and just understand, like, how can you discover your voice instead of following something where you can get lost in it. And um, I've heard it different ways. I've been to a lot of baby showers and weddings and got the big ups. But um, I felt like this is just my life work at this point because I had older adults who took an interest in my well-being, especially just coming up in the household as well between my moms and pops. I always felt like I had to represent them well. And so when you're talking to other adults or you're being addressed, you're just a reflection of your family. Right. And I wanted to just broaden, like naturally broaden my family. And I felt like I did that with a lot of young people that I either came up with and we all came up together. And then now we're, we're at the point where their children are coming to the art program nice. and, and we're having them go through it like their moms and pops went through. So I think that's just a gift with not necessarily saving their life, but like helping them become better people than they were when they first came into the mix. Nice, nice. Appreciate mm -hmm. you, brother. Like I said, we're here to salute you for that. <laughs> Appreciate it. So let's, um, let's roll it back and let's talk about your journey. Yeah. And how your journey went in, in all the odds, because you told me about being traveling around the world and places you have painted and things of that nature to other countries where your art is at now. Yeah. Um, if you can only imagine going to the barbershop every week just to, just to sit and talk, um, my big brother Aaron, he would always get in our get in our face about getting a passport, right? He was like, "Yo, get your passport, get your passport, because that's your key to the world." And I'm like, "Yeah, he talking passport, whatever." Got it. He would like force us to do it, you know what I mean? But I'm glad he did because I had an opportunity to go overseas. Um, I've had chances to travel, and this is all on the strength of like painting. You know, nice. um, being a graffiti writer, there's other graffiti writers in different cities. And before things got big on the Internet, there's always like a jam in different communities and different cities where, you know, you got brothers and sisters that are pulled together. I got a brother by the name of Pose, too, in Philly. He was like, yo, man, I'm exporting artists at this point, and I'm going to put them on the walls, and we're going to showcase, because Philly held weight like that. And you got graffiti writers from all over the world, or just the nation, east and west coast. So I felt like any time I was going somewhere, I, I got to represent the city, so let me make sure my skills are sharp. And being able to have that, um, that ability or just that exposure, like I went as far as you know, Belfast, Ireland, you know what I mean? The only brother there right. just repping, you know, and going through their shanties and seeing their work, building that exchange, and then um, going as close as Canada. And I didn't think that was out of the country, <laughs> right? I was like, Canada? Word? So going to Can um, Canada, doing the Style Summit, um, upstate New York and Binghamton, all types of places that I would never... It's not the, the, the place you hear in a rap song where you just dream about going. Right. But you go to these places and you represent. And so I felt like I had to build a very strong repertoire with the fellas I was traveling with to make sure that, like, when people heard the name, they knew I was serious right. and what I represented. It wasn't like a gimmick. It wasn't anything that you saw and forgot. There's people to this day that still be like, yo, I remember hearing your name. And I was like, let me see what this dude's about. And they saw that I was really about the craft. So that opportunity to travel not only opened my eyes up to what the rest of the world is doing, but it let me know how many of us are out there. Right. You know what I mean? We're speaking the same language. We have the same conversation. We we share experiences where, like, I go over somewhere and they hosting lovely. And I wanted to be able to do that if they ever came to the city. Right. So when they come to Boston, it, it was natural to be like, yo, 
like to have the ambassador film, you know, right. and take them to the hood versus what they heard about because we all know what the city represents. Right. But I'm like, yo, the neighborhoods that are within the city is what we wear like a tailored suit. Right. Man. You know what I mean? Right. And so they come here and I'm taking them to Shavu. We eating at Flames, you know, Flames now, but like anywhere, go take them down Dudley and be like, yo, Nubian Ocean used to be here. The elevator train used to run this way. Right. It's like talking about pieces of my childhood that turned me into uh, who I am and just letting them know too, though, you got that team hat on. We're grown now, but when we were younger, you couldn't rock that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There's certain things that you can and cannot do, but I was authentically making sure that people were experiencing the city so that they no longer got to ask, yo, black people in Boston? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we here, we 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 here, we repping. Yeah, you representing us well too, brother. Hey, I appreciate so, that. You know, and especially with that um that big piece, if y'all don't know, everybody, what is it? Rose Kennedy Greenway, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. how you say it. That's how you Rose say it. Rose Kennedy Greenway, the big mural, mural that's down there. This is the brother, the artist who, who painted it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the joint's titled "Breathe Life Together." Right. Man, what an experience. Um, that mural program that started over there about 10 years ago has always been curated to have artists from around the world come and uh, paint on that wall. I'm the first Bostonian to ever touch it. Right. Black Boston on top of that. So like that's that's one of those things where like it, it made it it made it an extra thing, but there was also weight on that as well because I was like, damn, you know, if I'm the first from here to touch it. And I started to think in the beginning, like, how out of everybody, because, you know, I'm passionate about what I do, but why me, right. you know? And the more I started getting into the development of the project, I was like, yo, why not me? Right. Because yeah. I know I have a story to tell. There's been a visual language that I've been creating for the past five years where I'm experimenting outside of the, the graffiti at this point. I'm like, yo, I'm hanging around greats like Paul Goodnight, Larry Pierce, you know, Rob Stowe, brothers like that, LaMurchie, Equa Holmes. These are our, you know, our OGs. Right. And so I was like, what can I do to carry that torch that they're passing to us in the form of uh, what we titled to be the fourth dimension? Because, you know, art is either two-dimensional or three-dimensional, but the fourth dimension is the story. Okay. So how can I contribute to that story? Because everybody has the ability to tell it. Right. And having that opportunity at the Rose Kennedy Greenway, that ventilation system is above a tunnel where I was like, yo, I created a mural series called Breathe Life. How could I transform this space to continue that message? And it, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Because right. now I put a boom box on the side of this building to amplify this message so it can go out into the city. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's like sort of the keys is into the message, into mm -hmm. the picture that people might not see or understand right away. Right, right, right. But now they get a glimpse of So let's touch on the subject real quick about that. So, okay, okay. Because we talked about it a little bit. So here we go. So when the, when the, the, the mural was completed, of course, you know, everybody that knows you in the, in, the, in the city, in the hood, everybody wants to give you your props. Everybody's posting pictures of it, putting it up all over social media or whatever. And so there was um, a brother that knows me. Mm -hmm. And he commented on, on somebody's post. I don't know whose post it was, but he commented on the post. And he had a different opinion based on just the picture itself. And he felt as though it was more of a negative thing of a uh, typical stereo, uh, stereotype of us as black people with a kid in b-boy clothes and a boombox. Mm. And, and he was saying, like, people celebrating that versus other role models or people he considered role models in our community who are do, doing things. Right, right, right. I just, you know, and then we felt to doing things. And one of the people that he said should be celebrated was me. And he tagged <laughs> me in the post, unbeknownst to me, he tagged yeah. me in the post. And yeah. so I was like, when I seen it, it was just like, you know, well, that's his opinion. It wasn't my opinion because I love the work mm -hmm. when I seen it. I never even took it no other kind of way, but that's our culture. That is. That's, that's what I seen from it. That you is. know, and lo and behold, here it is months later, I, I get to meet you in person. So I said, well, I'm going to bring up the topic to him and see if we can discuss it and ask him 
did um, has anybody else came give you any kind of different kind of um, opinionated versus that? Yeah, yeah. You know, and the fact that the person, you know, I didn't know that y'all had a off air conversation along the way. Yeah, I invited them to a conversation, and it, it was just dead air at this point because I think uh, when you don't know me and you don't know where my intentions come from, you can be set in your opinion real, real deep. Just on the strength of the, the artist name that I chose to go by, I'm not here to make everybody happy or comfortable. It's here to be in a conversation, a conversation that's overlooked and underappreciated, right? And so when I read what was sent to me, I was like, yo, this is cool. Like, this is somebody who's a complete stranger to my life and my upbringing. And so anything that he brought up was fact. But to challenge that fact, I'm like, listen, you have different heroes than I do, right? And we all speak, we're speaking the same righteousness, but in a different language, a different tone. So if I chose the lens or the language of hip hop to express what I'm talking about, I'm representing the past, present, and future in one photo. I'm showing a skill set, uh, a, a use of composition. I could talk the nines of the piece, but because I haven't told it in detail for somebody to just pick up, read, and describe, it's to invite that conversation. It's to open up that fourth dimension to tell that story. The, the, the idea of representation in a time right now where black portraiture is a, it's trending, right? But if you know me, you know I've never stopped doing it. I was doing it since day one. So the relevance of, the, of what I'm painting it's not just only right on time, but I felt like the rest of the world has caught up or at least built the comfort to see what we're able to do. And I put it in the middle of the financial district where people coined that ball to be the face of the city. Right. I'm like, yo, if that's the face of the city, let me put an image on there that's going to point you to the heart and where we come from. That when you look at this and you're from Boston, you know I'm speaking to everybody that's from here. Right. You know, I put a family heirloom on the wall. If you want to belittle that, that's only because you don't know my story. Right. And it's obvious. So when obvious things happen like that, it's cool because all the positive stuff outweighs it. But I listen to everybody and I keep my ear to the street because the one thing that you got to understand, being a muralist in that lens or that in that context, is that once you put it on the wall, it's no longer yours and it's not about you. Right. This wasn't a selfish act. It was selfless. I did something as vulnerable as putting that image up on the wall. And I know it's not going to please everybody. Art, art's subjective, you know? So when you're playing the game and you know what comes with it, if somebody's opinion stood and it stood firm, then good, because we're talking about it. But just know there's a conversation we're not going to be a part of, and that was the point of putting it together. The title of the piece is Breathe Life Together. Breathe Life was a concept that, like, you know, you're sitting in the shop, we can hear an album from our favorite MC and it's trash and everybody's bombing on it. But I'd be like, yo, what, what's one good thing that you heard on that album? And then everybody's got to sit back and think about it. But when we burning it, when we talking trash about it, it's easy to, to you know, to pile on it. So to breathe life into something is just to give it a second chance, you know? Breathe life together. I got the, the, the title of Together just to make sure that it's broken down into like syllables. If you said it and clapped your hands to get her, together to get her, like together is the understanding, the girl that's on the wall. So when I put the context together just so that people understand the series and the connection of it, it's a, it's a play on words. And like I said, I'm using, I'm using the, 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 the flyness of hip hop right, right. to describe that. Right. So if you understand me and you understand the culture that we come from, it is black culture. It's homemade. It's representing everything that this brother was talking about. You just got to get out of a, you got to get <laughs> unstuck. You know what I'm right. saying? So if I'm a newer generation and again, you know, big ups to everybody that we should be saluting, but I'm about balance, not about balance, but I'm about adding on to that landscape right. so that it goes deeper, you know? If the Smithsonian uh, Museum down in um, D.C. has an African-American branch and they have a whole hip-hop section, 
So is that stereotypical or is it something that we made, created, and own? You know, conversation goes. <laughs> My opinion, you definitely deserve to be applauded, mm-hmm. saluted, and all those above, and you are definitely one of those people. And um, just with your passion as you speak, and you have a program, and you got young men and women in it, mm-hmm. and I know what you spill off and I'll spew it out spills over into them. Mm-hmm. So I know they're on the right track. You know, I definitely can see that. I can <laughs> feel it. You know, so appreciate uh, I appreciate you, and I love the fact that you're doing that type of work. You know, so tell them the name of the program again. Yeah, the name of the program is called Artists for Humanity. You know, and what's the age group? The age group is high school age, from uh, 14 to 18 years old, or whatever your high school experience is. Okay. And then um, a lot of our teens that were like mentees in the program go off, get higher education, or pursue the creative industry in some way, shape, or form, and enough of them come back to become mentors or to help run the program in the capacity. So, so you know, what's the website? The website is uh, www.afhboston.org. Do okay. mm-hmm. you have an email, anything you want to give somebody if they need to get in touch with you or anything? Yeah, if it's in regards to the program, you can reach me at uh, Rob Gibbs at afhboston.org and then um, if you want to see the stuff that I'm doing as far as the graffiti writer it is pro black art p-r-o-b-l-a-k a-r-t at gmail.com alright so there you have it pro black sitting right here for y'all representing our community mm-hmm. giving back to our community and once again I want to honor and salute you it's my pleasure having you here today brother thank you appreciate you alright alright All right. that does it for this episode we'll be back again y'all stay tuned follow suit all day alright